we move on to our first um, panel discussion. Um, uh, Stephen Hill from Research Team is going to chair the discussion, um, and we'll give everybody five minutes initially to uh, explain their perspectives on INS and the move towards the future of the Earth. Um, I think we don't, we don't need introductions for uh, Margot and Martin, but uh, Stephen Hill is the director of uh, Research Team, so I'll speak as Steve for the rest of us as the program. Um, Hannah Hope represents uh, Wealth and Trust uh, and is involved in their open research activities. And Professor Roger Kane is from the School of Art Studies at the University of Scotland and is the chairman of the UK uh, Fellow Economics Group. So can you all please uh, make a call? Thank you. And um, probably before I start, I should thank uh, the organisers for promoting me to the Director of Research England. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, not director of research at Research England. <laughs> I also want to thank them for inviting me to this event, specifically on a, on a kind of very personal level, um, that they've brought me back to about 20 metres distance from where, as an 18-year-old, I embarked on my undergraduate career. So uh, I stayed in a room that's about there um, uh, in this college. So it's very nice to be back here in St. Catharines. Um, so we have a fantastic panel uh, that you've already heard from, uh, heard introductions from. Uh, to discuss these policy issues. Um, and the way I'm, I'm going to run this is, is as we said, we each have five minutes uh, of introductory comments, or up to five minutes of introductory comments. Um, and I'm hoping from that we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be able to spot some dialogue across the panel members uh, and have some discussion amongst the panel, and then I'll open it to the floor uh, for uh, comments and questions from the floor. Um, so I think I'm going to start by, by trying to paint a vignette of where we are in terms of the UK policy landscape on uh, open access monographs. Um, and uh, as in many uh, areas of public life, we, we are at an interesting point in terms of policy development for open access monographs. Um, we have a review uh, of open access policy in general by uh, the biggest research funder in the UK context, UKRI. And open access for monographs is firmly within scope of that review, um, and uh, that review is, is uh, reaching its point where it comes out in, into the public with proposals and a consultation on what that, those proposals might look like. So that's a very important context, but it does mean that those of us uh, from UKRI um, are very much in listening mode about what the challenges are around all of the, the open access options. But at the same time, in the context of monographs, we've, we've, um, we're reaching the end of a phase of intense evidence gathering where uh, we've been able to understand or, or gather some evidence on some of these thorny policy questions that have already been surfaced in the course of, of today. What are the models? Uh, what are the challenges around things like copyright, uh, licensing, uh, access to images, all of those sorts of things? What, where, where does green open access sit in the uh, options for open access monographs? We've been able to assemble evidence on some of those things, and we've also been, uh, in the course of the last year, able to really dig down and understand stakeholders <coughs> in that context. <coughs> and then alongside that, we have Plan S, um, which is, as already been mentioned, is a major international initiative uh, aiming to achieve a step change in the progress towards open access. And again, monographs are in scope of that commitment that a number of funders around the world have now signed up to, including UK on <coughs> um, The focus of Plan S, I think it has to be said, has, has been up till now very much on journal articles. And, and as Martin already mentioned, um, the decisions and policies around monographs have been uh, put back a little in the Plan S process in terms of timing, which I think gives us in the UK a real opportunity to show leadership in this area and actually to, uh, to steer Plan S in a direction for monographs, in a direction uh, that makes sense not only for the UK but also globally. And finally, we have the next REF. Um, the REF and the UKRI review are, are complicated in terms of their relationship with one another in that Research England, as part of UKRI, is uh, firmly involved and engaged in the UKRI open access review and, and will uh, need to follow the policies that are developed there. 
But at the same time, we share the governance of the REF with uh, our colleagues in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And so we need to reach a view uh, that is uh, as consistent with the UKRI ultimate position, but also takes into account the different policy perspectives that might be brought by uh, other funding bodies from different parts of the UK. Uh, and this is also tied up with uh, you know, a question that Martin raised about uh, the funding, the block grant funding that, you, that Research England provide, but also that's provided by uh, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland equivalents, and the extent to which that is tied up <coughs> in the question of open access mandates. So lots of, uh, of um, uh, complex issues, but more evidence than we have had um, it to inform this debate. Uh, and I think we're in a position to make some uh, really concrete but sensitive recommendations uh, in the coming months about how to take forward the open access monographs landscape. So I think um, that's the kind of context for our discussion. Um, so I'm now going to invite my panelists to make their uh, introductory remarks. And I'm kind of going to give the people who haven't yet had a chance to speak today uh, the, the first word and then move along the, uh, the panel in that direction. So I'm going to start with, uh, with Roger, if I may. Stephen, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for, for inviting me. I'm, I'm here, uh, as Stephen uh, said, as the uh, chair of the Universities UK Open Access Monographs Group. Uh, UUK set up this uh, uh, group in early 2016, uh, following uh, advice uh, to the then uh, Universities and Science Minister. <laughs> Uh, we are a group that brings around the table uh, representatives from, uh, from the funding bodies, from academics, certainly university leadership, research management and administration, uh, learned societies, libraries and publishers who try to en encompass uh, the key stakeholders in this uh, field. Uh, some of you may know we've published a number of reports uh, and next week a further report uh, bringing together work which we've been carrying out over the last 12 months uh, will be published, uh, hopefully on the 7th of October. Um, and as the voice of universities and their academics, uh, UUK uh, considers it absolutely crucial that the uh, research community engages with the development of policy for uh, open access monographs. Um, any open access books uh, policy needs to recognize that monographs are complex, that longitudinal pieces of work represent years of scholarly work, and that the monograph uh, as a mode of communicating excellent research is particularly significant to authors in the arts, humanities, and social sciences. But also that monographs are very different from journals and their papers. Uh, open access for monographs can learn from the uh, journal experience, but it can't simply replicate it. And as this is an event for, largely as I interpreted it, for, uh, for academics, uh, I will uh, make, I think, six points very briefly from the report that we're going to publish next week relating to academics as the creators of content in a policy context. And the first point is about open access and print. We've heard about this. Open access does not mean wholly replacing the physical copies of a book, but helps creators of content to reach wider audiences by making research uh, freely available in the public domain. OA and print will coexist. It's a misconception that OA means the end of print, but that is one of a number of misconceptions that we have found in our studies that still persist in the scholarly community. There is then, I think, a need for a strong, informed leadership from institutional senior management, from PVCs, from deans, to engage with policy development rather more than our surveys over the last year have found that they are. And these should encourage mentoring and peer-to-peer -peer support. Uh, to articulate the advantages of open access, explain the difficulties, deal with the myths. And I think in that context, this event today it is an absolutely exemplary one that one wishes would be replicated in uh, universities across uh, the UK. Secondly, peer review. Peer review underpins, of course, all scholarly publishing activity. The practice of peer review varies widely from publisher to publisher and from country to country, regardless of whether or not a publisher is providing open access. So there need not be a particular association between OA publishing and peer review, 
But that said, there is. We have found a continuing perception among academics that open access publishing is less likely to figure rigorous peer review, a myth that needs to be debunked. Thirdly, co-authorship. Academic scholarship, as we've heard, is an international endeavour. Researchers collaborate with authors outside the UK. They publish with presses from around the world, although predominantly with presses in the UK and the US. Perhaps now more than ever, these international links and collaborative partnerships need to be nurtured. UK OA policy should not inadvertently disincentivize international collaboration. Authors also need to be able to publish books in languages other than English to address their findings to uh, appropriate audiences. Fourthly, licenses. We've heard about this. It's clear from our engagement events and survey data analysis that academic researchers don't feel they know enough about the various types of Creative Commons licenses to make an informed decision about which license they should adopt uh, for their OA book. Informed commentators, on the other hand, tell us clearly that they believe a non-derivatist license must be an option within a future UK OA policy uh, for reasons of the nature of some humanities research communication. There's a need to identify how the lack of understanding of CC licences can be best addressed and where the source of that advice might be best placed. Fifthly, out of six, uh, third-party rights, we've heard a lot about this, the inclusion of illustrations in the form of maps, photographs, musical scores, other images essential to many scholarly works. <coughs> there aren't technical issues of including these kind of illustrations. That's not the problem. The problem, as we've heard, is acquiring the clearing, clearance permissions for the use of third-party material. That can make it potentially very expensive, if not prohibitively expensive, to publish books digital OA, uh, where there's significant quantity of third-party copyright material. And last but not least, by far, uh, academic careers. In all our meetings and interviews, uh, sector representatives stressed that challenges of open access publishing, both perceived and real challenges, are inherently bound up with very real cultural issues affecting early career researchers in particular, but also independent scholars. Early career researchers can find themselves moving from one institution to the next, meaning they're likely to lose out from benefits of being based at one institution, funding, uh, support from professional services staff, uh, from experienced academics. And those concerns mesh with broader concerns around transparency processes regarding university recruitment and promotion procedures when a publisher is used as a proxy for research quality. You know, recruitment and promotion panels really should ensure that it's the content that's being assessed, not who it's published by or whether it's published in print or whether it's published open access or both. So again, university senior management should take a leadership role in providing assurances that career prospects will not be affected negatively by choosing to publish OA books. And that as well as signing the San Francisco Declaration on Research, DORA, higher education institutions, research organisations should also adopt and apply its principles. We need to do much more to ensure the responsible use of research information and open access is caught in that wider issue. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Roger. So now we move on to Hannah Hope. And welcome. Thank you. Um, so, Welcome is probably most known for its funding of uh, health research, but we do have a very vibrant um, and diverse humanities and social sciences uh, research team within us. Um, we also have a huge um, and even more diverse collection of artefacts, th thanks to our founder. Um, so I'm going to talk mainly about RA policy on monographs and books, but I will also talk a little bit about what we try and do within the collection to support um, the use of the collection in an open way, and an accessible way. Um, we have had a books and monographs policy since 2013, and it requires that a digital copy be made available within six months of publication. Um, 
under a CC license if we are paying a fee. Um, we allow flexibility within what that license is, though we find that publishers are very much behind which license is chosen currently. Um, we will also accept, um, if we are not paying a fee, we're very happy to accept the author manuscript version of that article. Um, we are a relatively small funder or within the uh, humanities and social science. We've currently made about 140 chapters and monographs freely available, and those are available in a number of repositories, um, including NCBI Bookshelf and OARPEN. Um, when I checked um, in the last 12 months, those had 30,000 downloads. So we are probably talking relatively small outputs. We don't know what the print runs were of those books because we're not party that, to that information. So it's quite hard for us to compare the impact that our OA policy is having on the distribution of those books. Um, and I think that sort of stems more broader into an issue around monitoring our book um, and book chapter policy uh, in terms of compliance and the, the impact that it's having because in part because of some of the metadata issues particularly for book chapters um, and, and getting access to information on individual chapters is incredibly difficult and the accessibility of individual chapters I think is an issue um, we also have um, sorry I've just lost my train of thought <laughs> um, there are other issues. I might come back to that one. Sorry. Um, we do find that the policy is high maintenance compared to the journal policy, just in terms of scale and number of outputs that are covered by it. That is getting smoother and easier as publishers are adopting, more publishers are adopting open access options, and the transparency of those options is improving. Many publishers are willing to make books open access they are less willing to make that public knowledge on their websites is what we're finding. Um, third party images are an issue. It is an acceptable grant cost for us. Um, our researchers can claim funding towards that. Um, and funding for open access publications doesn't end when the grant ends. Um, long time frames and we accommodate those time frames, which again comes into the issues around monitoring. That was the point that I lost in my previous train of thought. We're not changing our policy for monographs in January 2021, unlike our journal policy. Um, there are several reasons for that, but as Coalition S, um, Plan S moves to look into that area, I think as Stephen said, it's a real opportunity for us to use our experience and show leadership in that field. On the collection front, I was really pleased to see Welcome Collection up there on a list <laughs> of um, collections, archives, and libraries that make life easier for researchers in terms of accessing and reusing collection materials. That is really important for us within the Open Research team that it's not just Welcome-funded research outputs that are more accessible. Welcome has a huge digitization project going on within the collection. We have a team that works incredibly hard um, to enable as much of that content to be openly available for both in terms of um, look uh, viewing but also in terms of reuse rights. And we also um, support researchers who are using those collection materials to make their outputs open access even if their research was not funded by Welcome. Um, if they don't have access to funding to make those outputs open access, we are willing to uh, fund that because we believe that that is essential to the further development of our collection and the knowledge that that collection can provide to humanity. I think that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Martin. Thank you. Um, I've said quite a lot this morning already, so I've just got six um, brief points. The first of which is that I should declare that I am a Plan S ambassador. Um, that's not advocate, and I see that role as critical, constructive in public dialogue, but I just wanted to make that uh, clear up front. Um, my thoughts around Plan S centre on the importance of a diversity of models for 
um, every aspect here and not cling to the rigidity of what's worked in the journal space. Um, for, the, for the journal space and development of planet policy, this has focused for me on zero embargo green being an option and looking to successful cases where that has worked. For instance, CEP, humanities, journal articles are zero embargo green and have been for a long time in the humanities um, without significant economic effects. But also making it clear that there are gold business models other than article processing charges and other than book processing charges. I think we need to work hard to make sure that future guidance really stresses a plurality of business models to support open access and doesn't send us down um, a book processing charge route as the default. If you set the ceiling, people go up to it in terms of price. Um, if people are above it, they, they come down, and that could be beneficial, but you've got to think about what your incentives are when you put this in. Um, the third thing I wanted to raise was um, around Planet's conditions of transparency for publisher costs. I think this is really quite difficult and potentially illegal, actually, to demand from suppliers that they give their internal costings um, as a condition for the receipt of public money. Uh, I'm not sure that Richard Branson turfs out his train um, internal operating costs despite benefiting from network rails infrastructure. Um, perhaps he should be forced to, I don't know, but there are difficult European and UK case law um, situations that need to be dealt with in terms of transparency. But I think more important than that is I want to know whether we should be thinking of good publishers as providers of publishing services or as co-producers of academic work and what we see publisher intervention as doing here. It seems clear to me that initiatives like um, the Royal Historical Society's publishing effort is not just a publisher, it is actually a co-producer of this work, it is an intellectual engagement and as a result the monographs that come out of that process, say from a thesis document, should be substantially refined, altered, different in their form to the input. Other publishers with broad list strategies are perhaps less hands-on, we might say. So I hate the term value add, it sounds horrible and cynical and marketing speak, but different types of publishers seem to me to be doing different types of intellectual work with authors. We value some types of this work more than we value others. How do we make those publishing types of entity part of the academy, valued and funded, and work to make their outputs open access, while thinking perhaps more cynically about for-profit entities who are not engaging with the same level of academic co-involvement that we get there? Um, fifth thing I wanted to raise was about timescales. Um, everyone is going to say that this is all happening far too fast, and the very knee-jerk response to that is, well, haven't we had 25 years to get it sorted, and we haven't. And I think there are arguments on both sides of this. For instance, we haven't seen, as was raised earlier, good experiment from massive publishers with huge levels of surplus, sometimes that are going back that surplus to already wealthy institutions, um, yet they claim they need funding in order to do an experiment on business models, even at a small scale. But I think some onus has to be put on organisations that are generating a surplus to take some of that responsibility themselves. On the other hand, do we want to scupper every small society publisher that has a book series at the moment by coming up with a model that doesn't work for them on a very short time scale? No, of course not. So again, types of entity and differentiation seem important to me there. Um, and the last thing I was going to say was about third party image rights, which we've touched on a lot today. The question that keeps coming back for me is, are these issues of open access or are they issues of digital publication? Isn't it as bad if we have a digital copy of a book that's not open access that has to be retracted five years down the line from any official circulation because the rights holder has said you can't do that anymore? That seems to me as big a blow to scholarship as it would if the open access copy were taken down. So. Often we're confusing issues of openness with just issues of digitality and galleries, libraries, archives and museums' inability to cater for the new types of form in which we're publishing. I know also that Simon Tanner has written a number of reports around the fact that most small galleries, libraries, archives and museums would see a better benefit in just 
allowing their material to be reused by academics and seeing greater footfall than they do in running a dedicated licensing department that involves hiring someone who sits there all year trying to work through these complex issues and paying that person. Um, you know, the returns are very slim for many um, cultural institutions in that respect. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And finally, Maya. So I have seven points, so these are going to be very um, quick. Uh, I am, as is probably well known to most people in this room, highly critical of Plan S, um, I think with good reason. Um, one of the reasons that I am critical is I think that it took what was an amazingly imaginative landscape of open access and um, made it more banal, uh, less realizable. I think that Plan S is asking a lot of the wrong questions and surprise, surprise, I think that means it's coming up with a lot of the wrong answers. And I'll hope to touch on one, of the, one or two of the ways in which I think that's the case. We do have a lot of evidence about open access. It's um, uh, quite um, interesting when you look at, say, the Plan S um, website and surrounding information that it has one citation <coughs> to any of those data. And that, as someone who trained as a biochemist and is still in an evidence-based discipline, makes me really, really nervous. Um, we are, as part of an RHS study, um, we've done a survey of history journals, which I was planning on bringing out yesterday, but I've delayed because the UKRI um, uh, uh, paper is coming out later, and very good, Roger, to know that um, your paper is coming out on the 7th of October. I'll delay even more, but we do aim to get that survey of 107 history journals, um, hybrid history journals, um, out uh, in time for the consultation. And the evidence there is really, really interesting. I can elaborate upon that later on. I've also looked at about over 100 history journals in the Directory of Open Access Journals. And again, that turns up some really interesting data as does culling the history journal outputs um, from the REF. Again, happy to elaborate about that later on, but I think evidence is really important here, and it's not clear to me that we have enough or enough apposite um, evidence. Um, I would underline again, that's a point I've already made, so I won't elaborate. I think it's really important to think about the life cycle of producing a piece of research, and that that actually begins at the level of the undergraduate, if not before and taking cognizance of the full life cycle will allow us to get this right in a way that I think the, partly because of um, HEFSI being divided off into Office for Students on the one hand and UKRI on the other. Um, we in the classroom and, and we as supervisors see the whole process, but I don't necessarily think funders do. I think that's a problem. I've already raised equality, diversity, inclusion um, and the 2010 Equality Act as issues. I won't belabor those points except to note that again, I think if we were asking the right questions, we might look at that rather differently. If you look at, for example, who has access to broadband in sub-Saharan Africa and who has access to broadband in um, Asia, um, it's gendered and it's classed. So access to broadband, um, which is necessary for a lot of the things we're talking about, is predominantly dictated by economic status in um, sub-Saharan Africa. It is much more restricted by gender if one turns instead to Asia. I think that's a really important piece of information that needs to be on the table. If you talk to a number of people in uh, low-income um, areas, they'll also tell you that um, they want to be able to download something that has as few bells and whistles as possible because of download times. So I think we need to think about those technological issues as well. And there are other disabilities issues that one could add into that. Again, I won't um, elaborate. I think the opacity of the language of Plan S is something that we really have to grapple with. English is my first language. I have struggled with it, and I'm not the only person for whom that's the case. But as part of our um, trying to extract uh, journal information from German, Swedish, uh, Belgian, and other continental European journals, um, we had some screamingly funny responses from uh, German editors who we tried to get to understand the Plan S website, even when we translated it into German. Um, one of my favorite responses was along the, line, along the lines of, please could you make it even more bureaucratic so I could even understand it less. That's a loose translation from the German. Um, so uh, uh, if, if open is meant to be about open, it can't also be opaque. So we've really got to work at presenting things um, more clearly if those of us who are trying to grapple with Plan S grapple with it. 
the funding landscape is obviously really, really important. I'm just going to focus here on the impact for learned societies, because that's, I suppose, what I'm representing at this table. I don't personally think that Plan S, even if in its worst uh, manifestations or versions, is likely to be devastating for the learned society over which I preside. But I also think that we are fundamentally uncharacteristic of the humanities learned society landscape. Many of the smaller learned societies I talk to are taking 90 to 95 percent of their income from their journal. We're not. But we are unusual. And I think you have to think about that and also situate it compared to STEM learned societies. So the figure I'll use here is Royal Historical Society, one of the two biggest history learned societies in the UK. We employed 2.1 FTE staff members. Uh, Royal Society of Chemistry employs uh, over 550 full-time staff members um, across uh, four international campuses. We cannot respond intelligently and well to Plan S in the same way that they can, and we shouldn't be asked to. Finally, repositories, and I'm partly going to plead here because there are university representatives and um, library representatives here. Access to repositories for early career researchers and for community-based historians has got to be sorted if Plan S comes into being. The ECR in an eight-month contract who you know, doesn't have um, access to his or her doctoral repository, and the University of London is to be applauded for giving their own PhD students three years of access to their repository, you will completely cut off access to publishing if we don't have access to repositories. Now, do I want my undergraduates citing in their essays from the green version in a repository? God, no. But if, and I think that's an issue we really have to deal with, that, that those green versions are not the versions we want people citing for all sorts of reasons, including, as Martin noted, fact-checking. But for doctoral students and early career researchers, access to a repository is not universal. And if we're going to implement this in the UK, somebody is going to have to pay for that universal access. Thank you. OK, thank you. So lots of interesting and um, provocative comments from the, from the panel. Um, before we open it to questions, I think I should give the panel members the opportunity to raise questions or comments about, about others' contributions. So do we have any comments or points that anyone would like to, to raise? I, yeah, I'd like to say about learned societies who do derive a lot of income from publishing and the tricky situation there. Um, often these communities are valued by disciplinary participants and they want the interdisciplinary activities to continue. It seems to me that the challenge here is that library budgets are used to fund those interdisciplinary activities and library budgets are stretched to the point where they deny researchers access to material because we can't afford it because we end up paying for the Royal Society of Chemistry's 500 employees out of our library budget. And what's the balance between those learned societies who do derive a large portion of their income from publishing having to say up front, this is what we're spending it on, do universities and funders want to support that versus hiding it bundled into a publishing cost? And I, I don't know what the answer to that is. My fear is that learned societies think that if they were forced to articulate what they do, they wouldn't be supportive, which is not a great statement of value from universities if their researchers are themselves saying we do value this activity. Um, but that seems to me one of the tricky things about unbundling learned society income and how we articulate the value of these activities in a way that means they don't just get defunded. And I guess to add on that topic, I th you know, um, we are very aware with our coalition partners of learned societies and the role that they play um, in the research environment. And so uh, two weeks ago now, um, there was a report published by Information Power who were funded by um, Wellcome and UKRI um, as part of Coalition S, uh, looking at uh, business models for society publishers. And I apologize, I have forgotten the acronym for that report, but I think it was SPAR OA. Um, but Information Power delivered it. They are the people who you can find it from. 
Yeah, and it is full. It's, an, it's a really interesting report, and I think learned societies would, would do well to look at it because there's some really useful information in there. And just in defence of the Royal Society of Chemistry for a moment, um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I was sharing some data just a couple of days ago on the, the publishing behaviour, and this is journal articles, not relevant to my graphs, but publishing behaviour of, uh, of chemists in the UK compared with the US, where there's been a m major transition towards open access in UK chemistry, largely driven by the RSC's uh, adoption of o open access models, versus a kind of stagnation in the states where the American Chemical Society has taken an opposite view. So I think learned societies do have a huge um, role to play in this. Yeah, right. and in the, in the monograph area, there's one particular group of UK learned societies that, that for whom you know, this is an existential issue, and that those are the, the, the record societies that exist to publish monographic long-form publications, and those only. And uh, uh, their position in respect to uh, the outcomes of publicly funded research, what is publicly funded research, what, what, how is public funding going to be defined in a, in a coalition S uh, UKRI uh, environment for <coughs> monographs uh, is something I think that's going to be absolutely critical and I think that yeah, we, we do need to be careful that in the search for perfection that we don't throw the good out yeah. and that there may need in the way of the world today to be some compromises so that we can move on to somewhere that is at least a much better position than we are at now if not absolutely absolute perfection. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's wise advice. Um, Let's open this to the, to the floor now. Are there uh, comments or, or questions on what you've heard? Uh, so I think open access is one part of a broader set of developments in scholarly communication which will just completely change everything in, in the long term. So my question to the panel is, is what's the balance of your thinking? I, I, do you spend most of your time thinking about how to make That's a really interesting question. I think that's for all the panel members. I might even chip in myself at the end. <laughs> Margaret, do you want to kick us off on that question? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to realize, um, like most people in, uh, in office of position in a learned society, I have a full-time job, and I do the RHS on top of that. So do I spend my time you know, addressing that final question? Well, if somebody took me off teaching and I didn't have 25 personal TTs and didn't have a life and I had a butler, yeah, I'd be asking those questions. But there's a huge amount of free, voluntarily extracted labor that goes into journal publication and book publication that is done on top of full-time jobs. This is one of the reasons I find the, the argument about what are learned societies for so infuriating. Well, if we weren't doing all that for free, where would, who would be editing your journals and your books? So I'm, I'm aware of and actually intellectually interested in the bigger issues, but am I in a position with a society of my size, which again is in a big humanities discipline and is you know, one of the two bigger societies? But we have to think about history in schools, we have to think about all of these other things. And I, I worry when those discussions get separated from knowledge production because actually what learned societies are about is knowledge production, broadly speaking. And that, that means we talk to exam boards every year. That, that means that we're dealing with this wider sociology of knowledge. And I think we have to start there and then ask the big questions rather than, you know, if I had time. Um, I read about, I try and read about the big questions, but no, we have not the capacity to, to do the kind of um, imaginative, interesting thinking you're asking about. We do our best. Roger? I think that there's a distinction between open access, which is obviously digital, and then there's digital uh, uh, um, uh, communication. And I think that the two uh, are not necessary. Yeah, we should think of them separately. Uh, I, I can see a radically different 
kind of uh, way of communicating humanities research in the future, not because of the OA drive, but because of the, uh, of the opportunities and the potentials of uh, the digital. And I think particularly in my own uh, world of, uh, of cartography maps and globes, uh, to be able to start to think about having three-dimensional components easily embedded to have data embedded within uh, the work so that the footnote uh, could cease to be quite as critical uh, a piece of uh, scholarly apparatus it is now because the, uh, the, the data can be there. So I think that the, the, the monograph as a long form publication is gonna change and it's gonna change I think not because of the drive of OA but because of the fact that there is the digital innovations that are coming along. Uh, so that I would not see uh, us talking in the same way in 10 years time as we are today. Martin? I think everything changes at a far slower speed than the digital environment encourages us to think. And actually people are gonna continue to write long form argumentative, mostly text based, piece of work for many, many years to come. So in my mind, there is an imperative to get that work as widely accessible as possible while thinking concurrently about digital possibilities. I mean, it's from, it's from the possibilities afforded by the digital that we get to OA. There's a kind of abundance thinking that everything could be open and online that comes from the uh, non-rivalrous dissemination of digital objects. But as I said earlier, when, when I was asked a similar question, the second you get into individual specific forms of media experiment, you get back down to the scarcity of unique artifacts that have no coherence to any kind of platonic form, and therefore don't fit within any kind of um, economy of scale for digital preservation, for how people read these things, for how we continue to ensure access to them. And I think it's, a, it's always got to be a tension between these spaces, one of which that encourages adherence to known forms that have intellectual rigor and that have known communicative capacities and preservation potentials versus people's desire to communicate in new ways, and whatever the driver of that is, whether it's social or technological. So for me, at the moment, the pragmatic priority is ensuring that our important long form arguments are accessible to as many people as possible via digital means. It doesn't preclude us thinking about what we might do differently in the digital realm, but I like to keep those questions apart from one another because they come with such different potentialities and you're talking about so many different things when you get into what could we do. Anna? Um, I would say that probably most of the time is spent thinking about more books open now, but within that we want to ensure that whatever systems we're putting in place that they are capable of accepting and supporting and rewarding changes that academics choose to make um, within the formats within the, that they publish. So we, we're kind of cognizant of this potential. Um, we would love to see um, experimentation and change. I think as Martin says, there is, you know, a more pragmatic need to actually make what we've got currently um, available, um, but we want to ensure that we can, we can recognize and reward those new systems or formats as and when they are presented to us as a funder, whether that is as an output, a grant application, as a use of our collection. Um, yeah, so I think we try and think of both, but very much on the, the sort of current format at the moment. So if I can uh, abuse the position of chair and also answer your question, because I think it's a really interesting one. And, and um, you know, I agree with a lot of things that have been said ac across the panel, um, but just two, two points to that. One is a, is a plug for the fact that we're about to publish a report looking at the future of research that's involved uh, survey of uh, three and a half thousand researchers across the UK and one of the questions we were interested in um, was was how people saw the diversity of research outputs changing um, and I think the, the answer on that point was that researchers do see on average 
um, a, a shift in the number of, and the diversity of the outputs that they're likely to uh, produce in the future. So I think I think there is the, the potential is recognised, but I have to say, you know, building on Martin's comment in a way that that those changes are relatively small and they and they will be quite slow. <coughs> um, in terms of the relationship between making uh, current content open access and you know the, these new forms of of publication. I see them actually as a continuum of, of the same thing, and in many ways, open access is a, a prelude uh, to some of the more exciting uh, and novel ways of linking together scholarly material. So, you know, again, Roger mentioned the idea of, of maps that have uh, evidential segments hidden behind them in some sort of three-dimensional hyperlinked sort of way. Um, but to be able to do that, you need to be able to harvest and access the evidence base some of which will be textual, um, that sits behind those, those sorts of things. So I think open access is an enabler to innovation in the way in which scholarship is both conducted and, uh, and presented. Um, so it, in a sense, I'm dodging your question by saying, well, by focusing on one, you're actually also focusing on the other. Another question? Oh, lots. Yeah. Right, I'm gonna put the three, <coughs> so I'm gonna collect these three questions, and then we're gonna give the panel uh, okay. One more go uh, to answer whichever ones they want to answer. Do I get to throw this after? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. as long as you throw it that direction, <laughs> yeah. it's fine. Um, my name's Lou Peck. I just had a question for you, following on from what you were just talking about, and also what Margot said earlier. Is why do we dictate what format digital content has to be in? So why do you have to have an ebook, and why do you have to have a journal article? Surely, at the end of the day, it's all content and it should be easily discoverable, it should be indexed. And I say this from someone that's um, done research and we were commissioned by the University of Huddersfield Press to do some research into how to make their content more discoverable. And it's so incredibly difficult for small um, publishers and presses to get their content, or aggregators to get their open access content discoverable, whether it's journal articles or books. But my what I'm wondering is why do we dictate or ring fence and say it has to be an ebook, it has to be an article? Can we not um, put it on a platform, or however we um, place it out there, so that readers can digest it how they want to read it and the choice that they want to do it? Surely it's technology and you know technology is much more advanced than it used to be. Okay, great question. You now get to throw the microphone well, no. behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Who, where's oh, the next well, one? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, there are two more. Hi, sorry, I just wanted to um, say that I am from the Royal Society of Chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess a quick perspective, but also a general question. Um, I guess uh, we're obviously being very proactive in our response to finance when it comes to our general publishing program. Our book program is being as much smaller as being very reactive because of the different motivations for book writing and editing in SDM compared to HSS. I don't know if the panel has kind of comments on whether we should be being more proactive as an SDM publisher in book publishing. Very quick perspective of uh, financial modelling, say for gold open access, you're right, a publisher can work out quite easily the direct costs in producing a book. We can use best practice and methodology for looking at indirect costs. Uh, but from my point of view as well, um, as a society publisher, we can publish books that make a loss, and we might have a responsibility to do that as far as scientific dissemination goes. But I also have a responsibility for uh, generating surplus to put back into the Royal Society of Chemistry's activities, and there'll be an expectation on that level of surplus and a return of our investment, because I have to justify our books program compared to our much bigger journal program, um, and how you want to quantify a return on investment if kind of a Okay, and the third one before we move back to the panel. <laughs> um, my name is Emmanuel Sowati. I come from Ghana in West Africa. Um, I'm a student, of, um, a PhD student at the Institute of Criminology um, here in Cambridge. Now, my is an observation, and then I have a question. Um, this observation that asks us um, in terms of having access to materials and having access to journals um, is quite um, a challenge to people from Western parts of Africa and Africa as a whole. 
Um, but I think that this open access in terms of access of the end product um, has far-reaching consequences in different ways. And one way that readily comes to mind is research ethics and the extent to which researchers would forthwith engage with various constituencies. And I have a specific example. There's an article I saw about three or four years ago and the interpretation, and this is a top professor, um, I mean internationally reputed, who had written consistently on Ashanti. Ashanti is one of the oldest empires in Ghana. Ghana defined as that geographical space. And, and he had published an article in a top journal. Um, and the interpretations were suspiciously unlike. And I hadn't seen it for a long time. I got it because he had cited my work somewhere in that article. And the interpretation was fine. But the broader interpretation he had given to a series of events, referring to a particular um, 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 demonstration that had happened in Kumasi, was totally unlike. He had mentioned um, the police commanders, he had mentioned um, the police institutions. And I fought with police consistently for more than 21 years. And so when I saw the article, I called the Inspector General of Police. That is equivalent, I don't know, to your Met or something. And then the regional commander, Ghana is divided into regions. And the regional commander at that time, and the head of CID in that region at that time, and said that I've sent this article. It was written around when you were the regional commander, when um, this person was head of intelligence in that region. And this is the interpretation um, and the narrative this top professor had put out there. And I've seen that article after eight years. And they almost fell through the roof. And it wasn't true. Now I'm going to do an addendum to, I mean, a response to that when I have time. But I'm saying that given the fact that consistently um, people will come to communities, I can speak for Western Africa, where I've been for nearly 50 years. You know, I'm getting to 50. Um, apart from my UN missions, I'm always there. Now, I've seen engagements where people would come, um, researchers would come to communities. Um, sometimes um, stay there for years, write publications. Some are true, some are not true. But I'm saying that when you have open access and the younger generations who have more access to social media, who have more access to side issues, will go back and tell their parents that this person who came has said one, two, three about you, has interpreted our culture in this way, has interpreted some of the things they have seen in this way. I'm sure that subsequently, People are going to be careful when they are dealing with researchers from particular constituents. And the positive side is that you empower by default some local constituents. But um, in addition to that, I think there's going to be some revolution around research ethics and how researchers engage with some communities. And I think that in that light, open access defined in terms of access to the product, access in terms of having access to different researchers by young and old researchers from communities. I think that would be binary and would have um, a positive spin to it. Of course, the counterfactual would be that some people would have to um, um, put in on quotes, um, um, try to defend positions. But I think that all in all, it will precipitate, you know, um, um, narratives, counter narratives. It will, it will, it will, it will create a space where people's interpretations can be challenged, where you have better um, um, and collaborations. Um, and I think that it is something that I should bring to our notice. That some of the interpretations, um, if you go back to our people and ask them that this is what this person who has lived with you has said about you, um, it, it, it will be interesting. Let me leave it there. Yeah. Okay, so three really interesting points. Um, so each of you now have ooh, um, less negative time, a minute each, <laughs> um, to respond to those three points, which, which, well, whichever of those three points you, you wish to. So what the first one was about, the, about should we be encouraging a more diverse, more diversity of formats and or, can, on, on the other hand, not specifying formats as tightly. Um, role of STM publishers in, in book publishing and open access. And then I think really interesting point about, about the, the mm. potential inclusivity and challenge to the research process, good challenge to the research process that comes from open access. So uh, I'll go in reverse order of last time, so I'll go to Hannah first. Okay. Um, 
we try not to dictate format. Our policy applies to original research, um, and that can, you know, it can be a journal article or it can be a book chapter or, it, you know, that's that's our essential um, definition of, of when it, our open access policy applies. Uh, we do have platforms that explore format. Uh, welcome open research. Uh, in terms of proactivity on open access books within STM, why not? Um, you know, I think all areas of science or all areas of research, if they can explore different options and different routes to delivering uh, research outputs, I think that's very positive at the current time. And uh, absolutely, um, I think research ethics is very key um, to good research practice and research delivering value for all and open access is, is just a small part of that, but I think it can be a very important part. Okay. Um, okay, so why do we dictate format? I think there are several reasons for that, not least is the academic career hierarchy that recognises specific types of output as having value and using that media form actually as a form of proxy uh, judgement, but also as one that confers value. I mean, there have been huge experiments in the length of books since the mid 1990s, Duke University Press was doing it then, coming up with mid form length books and going from there. Um, I also think format could refer to the way in which we present material and what implications that has for machine readability, discovery, ingest, and so forth. So it's always a tension for me between standards, whether social or technological, and innovation in communication that could make that fundamental act of human to human communication. Uh, work better. Um, in terms of STMs and books, I'll just say that Darwin's On the Origin of the Species <laughs> is probably the most influential publication in the last couple of hundred years, and that's a science book. Um, it's interesting how they've gone out of fashion, but once upon a time, they were the medium through which you could in communicate essential ideas. On the research ethics front, I just think it's a shame that this isn't done already, and that it takes the exposure of bad practice to fix it. What, if you're doing research on human subjects, they should be involved in that process, whether there's a paywall in front of it or not. Um, but I think you're right that the greater scrutiny that could be provided through open access is an important driver for getting people to behave better when dealing with communities and how they're interpreted. Roger? I think it's really good that, that research ethics has come up at, you know, uh, this morning. Um, one of the arguments that's used uh, for the need to have no derivatives licenses comes from disciplines like socioanthropology, where uh, there are uh, lots of uh, embedded interviews in, uh, in a piece of research work, interviews where uh, there was a kind of social uh, if not uh, and, mo and moral uh, contract issued and entered into between the interviewer and the interviewee uh, that the words that were that were taken down would be kept and would not be altered and would not be uh, would would not be used in any other way other than in the verbatim context in which they were they were given. So I do think that that those sort of ethical issues there are ethical issues around. Uh, 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 publication generally, but that they have an increased heighten when they are uh, when when uh, they are converted into into a digital form uh, as for for open access. Um, uh, STEM and uh, uh, and uh, long form publications, yes, long form publications clearly now uh, occupy a very different space in the in 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 the world of STEM by comparison with the, the arts and humanities. But uh, our work in the University of the UK group has uh, looked at uh, long-form publications across the piece. And yes, they, they do exist. They are less often uh, re returned to uh, uh, things like the REF in the UK, for example, but they are there. And I, and I think it's great that the Royal Society of Chemistry is starting to look at them. And I would urge you to, uh, to follow the kinds of debates that are happening in the humanities and uh, to, to look at what you have and how you might be able to uh, uh, take those uh, uh, and perhaps modify them for the particular kinds of uh, long-form publications that you have in the STEM subjects. And Margot, 
Yeah, thanks very much. Um, to my mind, underpinning all three of the questions really is um, a bigger question, which I think the, um, the speed and the, the way in which Coalition S has done Plan S has tended to move off the table. And that is the question of who and what is open access for. And I think if we start there, we come to very different answers to these three questions. So the first question, <coughs> excuse me, um, about the form um, and the format um, of open. I would add an additional form of open, which isn't actually about publication and it isn't about digital, and that's impact. Mm -hmm. I can think of all sorts of research that is actually going to be more meaningful to the constituencies that it's best suited to address if it's what we might call an impact case study, and I mean that broadly, not necessarily something that is submitted to REF. So if I think, if, if, if the question is, how do, we, how do we increase the likelihood that our research will do good? The answer isn't necessarily open. Um, or open might be a part of the answer to that question. So I think starting with the right question might lead us to get to a better answer there. Um, uh, I could illustrate that, um, but I'm, I'm not going to because I know time is even shorter than I am. Um, so to go back to the Royal Society of Chemistry, which I am, not, uh, you know, I did not intend that as an attack, and I hope it wasn't taken at it, but it is a matter of scale that if you're applying the same expectations to how you're not going to negotiate this and how I'm going to negotiate it, you know, that is not an equal uh, playing field. I think there that it may be entirely correct that the five-page journal article, which is standard in your discipline, is the best way of doing research, and that the monograph, which is fundamentally different in intention and in kind in my field, is the best way of delivering you know, the, the results of research, and I think we have to respect that. It's the leveling there. It's of saying everything is the same despite disciplines. If that's true, we wouldn't have disciplines. Um, so I don't want to impose my model on you any more than I want you to impose your model on me. And then to, to go to the final gentleman's question, which I think is really, really important, and Roger's picked up on this, and it's obviously embedded into the CC by, uh, CC by ND, CC by ND, and C um, debate. Um, the ethics are really, really important, but why should we assume that the issues are the same throughout the entire world, across every discipline, and across every type of research we do? I don't think they are. Courses for courses, and again, if we ask the right questions, we might be going down different pathways than we are at present. I think this totalizing vision is deeply problematic because that's not how research is configured, and it isn't how researchers are configured either. Thank you. Okay, so I think we've had a fascinating panel discussion. Um, I think we're going to wrap it up now um, as we're well into the lunch break. So I'm um, going to end by apologising for being such a poor chair and eating into the 10 minutes of your lunch, um, and also by asking you to thank our panellists for their contributions. And to thank you.